how beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Things are changing. And sometimes you don't know it until your world is upside down. As our tools move faster, so do we. We're climbing an evolutionary ladder. But what will humans be when man makes man in his own image? You may be surprised at what you find, a musical universe knit together by dancing strings, a world where aliens live right before our eyes, a world that just might lose most of its living creatures, but where man somehow slips through. We haven't got many answers, but we've got some terrific questions. Everything physical in this universe of ours, everything we know or are likely ever to know is part. Does this man know the secrets of the cosmos? Everything is made from string. String here, yes. A tiny little loop of energy that looks like a string. And that's where the name comes from, a string. He's talking about string theory, but what is that? We may have a theory that can describe everything in the universe by invoking one master equation. And where could it take us? What if, in our lifetime, we were able to tell with certainty where the universe came from and how it all began? We've got some terrific questions. Plenty of questions on the road to a brave new world. At the very bottom of it all is the same question most of us have been asking since we were three years old. Why? Why do birds fly and dogs don't? Why did my hamster die? Why do things fall down rather than up? Part of what makes us different from one another as we grow older is simply that some of us just stop asking sooner than others. Or maybe we simply stop expecting to find answers. This is a program about people who have never stopped asking. They actually expect to find an answer to the ultimate question, to discover why the universe was put together as it was, or if not why, at least they expect to discover how. And here's the latest, the bulletin the part that'll really blow your mind. Some of them have recently become convinced that they have identified a critical piece of the answer. And if they're right, it could lead us into new dimensions, the possibility of traveling backward and forward in time. It could provide the answers to how it all began and how it will end. Now, most of us who checked out of this quest somewhere between Algebra I and Trigonometry are perfectly content to beg the ultimate how and why questions with the same one-size-fits-all response that most parents have been using since the beginning of time. Well, because, we say. And then some of us, feeling a need to invoke the ultimate authority, add, because that's the way God intended it. But here's the point. Whether or not it was the Almighty who programmed it into us, curiosity is clearly a recurring theme in the human condition. Nowhere more so than in my old friend Robert Krolwich, who will once again be our guide this evening on what is truly a mind-bending journey. What you will discover is that oneness seems to crop up again and again in the answer to the ultimate question. Whether it's one God, which is the answer offered by most of our major religions, or one original element, which many modern scientists seem to feel could serve as a basis for the theory of everything. There has to be a starting point. And deep thinkers of all cultures and backgrounds have come a long, long way on their search. One of the best teachers I've ever met ever is about to take you on a trip all the way back to the beginning of time, to the very instant of creation. He can't tell you who created the universe, that's not his department, he's merely a scientist, but he does think that he can show you the very first thing ever created. You'll see it tonight, the single raw ingredient that built the universe. 
This theory is called string theory. It takes a little getting used to, so I want to back up and begin with an old, old story, which we are updating, we hope, in a very stylish way. As you can see, we're not quite ready, but I can tell you the story comes from an ancient tribe in Europe. This is their creation myth that explains how the world and how everything in the world came to be. We found it in this book right here, which is called the Kalevala. It's the epic poem, the national epic poem of the people of Finland. And in the book, you will meet, first of all, an egg, the egg is the symbol of fertility and life. In the book, you will also meet a sea goddess named Ilmater. This is the model, Ingrid Seinhav, and she's going to be the sea goddess. Nice face, but fabulous knee. The knee is going to be mainly the subject Thank of the you. story. You're welcome. <laughs> we also have asked photographer Michael Zepatello to photograph hi, an explosion. There's going to be a little explosion because that's the moment of creation. We also have, you notice back there, a tub. In the, hold on, in the tub there's some water, of course. The water represents the beginning of time because as the story says, in the beginning there was nothing anywhere but an endless expanse of water, except under the water there lived, well, one lonely goddess. So Michael, I'm ready if you're ready. I'm ready, Robert. Okay, okay everybody, let's shoot this. Once upon a time, when there was nothing anywhere but the sea, the empty sea, a bird appeared, looking for a place to create the world. But looking across the water, there was no place anywhere to lay an egg, until the sea goddess Ilmater graciously raised her knee out of the water and gave the bird a place to nest. But the egg she laid was warm with life, too warm for the goddess who was used only to the cold water. And as the egg got warmer, the goddess shuddered in pain. And when she jerked her knee, the egg exploded. And part of the shell became the earth, and another part became the sky, and the egg whites became the moon and the stars, and the yolk, the yolk became the sun. And so from that one egg, from one source, everything that is came to be. That's an old, old creation myth. But today, when theoretical physicists on campuses all over the world ask the same question, how did things begin, sometimes their theories aren't all that different from the story of the egg. You're Brian Green, right? That's right. From Columbia University. What do you do for a living? I teach here at Columbia and do research on physics and the origins of the universe. So you're in the physics department or in the math department math or both? Math and in physics and both. Both. So you saw the creation myth. Okay. Now let me ask you something. That creation myth had at its core the idea that everything in the universe starts from one thing. Not only is it one thing, it's a simple thing and a beautiful thing. My question for you, since you're in the physics biz, is do you do something like that? I would say that that's really what we're all shooting for. We're trying to show that the universe and everything in it, all the stars and galaxies, all of matter, space and time itself, all emerge from a single starting point, some unified notion from which the universe as we know it emerged. One thing. One thing. Perhaps it's a master equation. Perhaps it's a single overarching principle. But whatever it is, Brian Greene believes that everything in the universe can be explained by something very simple and very beautiful, like an egg. The ground state is merely going to be defined in terms of the VEVs, the vacuum expectation values of scalar fields being equal to a certain value. Just but of course, when physicists try field, to figure out where everything comes from, they don't tell each other stories about right eggs now. and goddesses. A1 star A1 minus A2 star A2. Any questions? They talk in, what would you call theta, this? Theta, theta bar, theta bar. In their own language. Hermitian symmetrize it. How do you begin to, to think like a mathematician? Okay, for example, I figure, uh, let's see, if I pick up a leaf and then another leaf, and I think, gee, let's see, there's one, two, three things here, and look at this. There's one, two, three things here, same, same. Right. I, Did I you think... look out the window when you were a kid and think, hmm, same, 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 same? Close to it. I think all of us who were involved in mathematics from a young age were fascinated by pattern. There are some patterns that everybody sees, 
and some patterns that are hidden in nature, but with mathematics you can pluck them out. 2,600 years ago, Pythagoras discovered that if you pluck half a string, or if you clink a glass that's half full, or ring a bell that's half size, or blow a flute that's half size, every time you cut something in half, the sound you get goes up one octave exactly. Pythagoras had discovered a clue to how sound works. Brian remembers when he discovered that math can tell secrets about the world. He was 14 and he was in high school. It was a class of students who were really interested in physics, so it was those who already had some sense that that was the direction that they might go. So, okay, so you went, oh boy, this is the ball of gum and from the wall. That was the moment we were all waiting for, it, the, the ball of gum problem. The question was, if you take a ball and you stick a big wad of chewing gum on the ball, then you attach the ball to the ceiling, then you let the ball drop. Can you predict how the ball is going to swing through the air? Brian did the calculations that show how the ball should arc through space. The wonder of it was, though, that balls with gum actually do what the math says they're going to do. And Brian remembers running down the hall to tell his dad, look at these numbers. But the way I would show him was, Dad, if you had a ball which was stuck to a piece of chewing gum and the other end was stuck to this, I just re-ran the problem and asked him, can you imagine figuring out exactly where it would land or exactly what path it would This is a guy who was playing harmonicas for a living. And, 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 and singing and composing. Singing and composing. Yeah, okay. But he got into this sort of stuff and he'd be like, I don't know if I can. And then, you know, I'd explain to him more or less how, how it goes and he loved this stuff. So this is not conversations that can only go on between the elite, the knowledgeable ones. It's ones that you can translate to ordinary people, oh. particularly if they're your dad. Oh, absolutely. I think that the concepts of physics are ideas that anybody with a bit of interest can grasp and think about and be excited by. His interest in physics survived an early obsession with judo and a later fascination with acting and with the theater. It was almost impossible to imagine, you know, other people wrote papers or, um, you know, did equations. He did equations, but he, you know, we always used to wonder about Brian because nobody could ever figure out what he did. George Stephanopoulos met Brian at Oxford in England. They were graduate students together. We knew he would go into these kind of days-long trances with a piece of paper. He would actually sit at a desk and try and figure out how the universe began. And I certainly couldn't understand how someone could sit at a desk and figure that out. But he's still at it, and sometimes he's really good at it. Is there a sort of in-the-zone quality about this kind of thing? I mean, if you're playing basketball there or tennis or anything, you can get to a certain point where just everything goes right for you. Do you have those? Rarely. <laughs> but when it happens, it's incredible. It does happen. One equation is interlocking with the next in a way where you know it's right. You just feel it's right. It can't possibly be going along so smoothly without what you're doing being correct. But there's some kind of wind at your back that is yes. not coming from you. Yes, yes, definitely. It feels like you're tapping in to the universe. That in some sense the universe is this giant flow of ideas and information and every so often you're able to reach in and grab hold of something and get swept along with it. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah, you should do it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we come back, we'll give you a taste of what it's like to follow the math back to the first instant of time, to the creation. about the Big Bang that very possibly created our universe and is still pushing galaxies and stars apart even now. If the universe has been expanding ever since at a predictable rate, you could kind of like with a movie projector, reverse directions, run everything backwards to figure out what it was like back at the beginning. We can't really make a new Big Bang. That's something which is beyond our ability, but we can Simulate it's kind of like a physics moviola. Right, it is. You can just start churning it forward. Right, or and, backwards. And, and, we hope, backwards. and we hope to use the laws of physics to turn that film further and further back in time. At the moment, we can get back, depending on who you ask, to perhaps a minute after the Big Bang or a few seconds after the Big Bang. But we want to go right back down to time zero. 
So that requires turning it even further and with current theories, that's something that we can't quite do yet, but that's the goal. But we can show you what things were like just after the Big Bang, and this is going to sound strange. We can do that by looking deep into Brian Greene's eye. Deep, deep in. Because behind his eye, we will find some blood cells, and in those blood cells, there are molecules of hemoglobin, and in those molecules, there are iron atoms, And if we took one iron atom from Brian's eye and told you its life story, rewinding all the way back to the first instant of the very beginning of this atom, we would be almost at the Big Bang itself. The atom in Brian's eye is very, very old. It's in him, but it came to Earth five billion years ago when it was drawn into the dust that was swirling together to form our planet. Before that, it was floating in space a little iron atom, all by itself. And before that, billions of years earlier, it was inside a star that fused 50-odd protons and neutrons together, so a star created the iron atom and spit it out. But before that, our iron atom didn't exist yet. Instead, it was a bunch of lighter and smaller atoms bouncing around. And remember, says Brian, As you go further back in time, the universe gets smaller, denser, and hotter. Much, much hotter. Too hot and too violent for even the smallest atoms to stick together. So very early, everything, even protons and neutrons, break apart, and all that's left is a a primordial stew. Everything we know about, literally, every star, every galaxy, planets, you, me, all of matter, in fact, space and time as well, are crushed together. Even time? Even time. Whatever that could mean? That's right. So even the very notion of time is something which emerges from the Big Bang. We're now at the raw beginning of everything. Right. And when was that? That was probably something like 15 billion years ago. I won't even ask you what happens before that, except all we know is there's that... All right, I'll ask you, what happened before that? We don't really know. (laughs) But but let me say this, it may be that the question of what happened before the Big Bang may not have any meaning. It may be the case that it's certainly reasonable to ask what happened before today or what happened last year or the year before. But if time itself is beginning, there wasn't any time. That's right, so there's no notion of time, perhaps, until you have a Big Bang. So the whole question ceases to have meaning when you go sufficiently far back, namely to what might be the origin of time itself. But what I'm really wondering is, when you get all the way back to the instant after the Big Bang, when everything was raw and violent and unattached, what I really want to know is, in the beginning, what was there? What was the first primal thing? Brian and the other physicists have a theory. It's a theory called string theory. String theory? Yes. Because why? Because this is a stringy thing? Well, it's because the fundamental ingredient, at least in the usual formulation of the theory, is a tiny little loop of energy that looks like a string. And that's where the name comes from. A string. What an odd shape for the fundamental object of the universe. Remember that when we began this program, Brian said that when physicists look for the fundamental object, it should be simple and elegant and beautiful, like the egg from the creation myth. But when you think of a string, well, at least the stringy things that we meet in ordinary life, they don't seem quite satisfying. So, uh, at least not to me. But when Brian and I wandered around New York City's East Village and asked people, what if everything in the universe were made from tiny strings? Strings. I'm (laughs) complete. I'm completely lost. <laughs> Strings. 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 Is that an acronym? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Some were a little puzzled, but most of the people we met, like these two, were intrigued. Is that a puzzling shape to you? A satisfying one? Just what's your emotional reaction to huh. that? An undulating strength. Puzzling. I don't think puzzling. Okay, unnerving. Perhaps soothing. (laughs) Would it be soothing? No, it would not be soothing. 
I mean, it's kind of interesting when you think about when you think about like waves of light. Right. So energy radiating. Right. It's all movement. Everything's in motion Strings. anyway. It's it's groovy. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy, and that is before Brian explained why the fundamental unit of everything may be stringy, which he'll do in just a minute when we return. We then have additional quadratic... There's no way that you or I could ever understand the math that led to this theory, but don't worry. It's not that hard. Because two of the smartest people in the modern world, Albert Einstein on the one hand, and the brilliant Danish scientist Niels Bohr on the other, argued for years about math and the universe. It came down to a question of gravity. On grand scales, with galaxies and planets, Einstein's math predicts exactly how gravity works. But when you get down to scales smaller than atoms and electrons, Einstein's rules break down and Niels Bohr's rules take over. Einstein said, no, no, we got to look harder. There's got to be one rule for gravity, big and small. And then, says Brian, strings came along. Why do we need strings at all? Like, what, are, are they solving the problem? Oh, definitely. String theory, we believe, solves the central problem that theoretical physicists have faced for perhaps the last 50 years. Let me stop you, because I, I have two friends who are not theoretical physicists and have certainly not been alive for 50 years, Josh and Adam. I asked them to explore this problem for us. Let me show you what they've done. Why strings are necessary. A short analysis. Okay, look, here's the problem. Theoretical physicists want to explain everything in the universe. They want to know how everything works. Problem is, right now, they can only almost explain everything in the universe. Yeah, and almost everything in the universe isn't good enough. It's not even half good enough. Physicists know how big things work. Physicists have a whole set of rules for big things, like planets, stars, and galaxies. Right. They can plot the path of the planet Mercury with infinitesimal accuracy. They can calculate within a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second what happened after the Big Bang. Huh. In the big world, these rules work. Physicists also know how small things work. Physicists also have a whole set of rules for small things. Little things that are smaller than atoms, like protons, neutrons, and electrons. These rules have taught us how to push electrons through computer chips, wow. how to create laser beams, and how to split atoms. Huh. In the small world, these rules work. But... While physicists have explained how things work here in the big world... And how things work here in the small world... The rules that they made up for the big world... Yeah. They don't work in the small world. And vice versa. <laughs> There's no fit. They don't match. Shut it off! So... You can't have two sets of rules for the universe. You want to have one explanation for, for everything. everything. And it's true. For most of his life, even Albert Einstein tried and tried to find one explanation that accounts for how both big and little things work. He was deeply troubled that the world didn't fit together. And Brian says, you know, if you thought about it, you'd be troubled too. So you're saying that ordinary people, if they knew that there wasn't one explanation for everything, that the world didn't quite fit together, would feel... Just a little bit anxious. I think so. It's not the kind of thing which would inform day-to-day -day life from moment to moment. No. But I think when one is sitting down in a quiet evening and contemplating life in the universe, if one knew it was fractured in terms of the big and the small, and why should there be two different languages which don't speak to one another when we have one universe? There should be one language that describes everything. So let me see if Josh and Adam can solve this for us. They're going to begin with a simple piece of mechanics in the regular world of the big. Here's something you see every day. Balls of steel. These steel balls can fall through space. See? Ball fall. Now, Einstein taught us a lot about gravity. But to understand what he's talking about, we're going to represent space with a sheet of latex. Latex is space! Yeah! When an object falls to the Earth like this, what's actually happening is that space is bending just a bit into a smooth slide, which gently carries the ball from here all the way down to here. Confused? Don't be, because Einstein's idea has been tested and proven and proven and proven over and over again. When things fall, uh -huh. they slide through a smooth warp in space. A smooth warp in space. Great, but what about this small world, huh? If we were to magnify... What are you going to magnify? A small point in space. How small? A really, really tiny, tiny, tiny space. Here, physics is really different. 
Space is bopping and bumping and jumping around. If you tried to drop a ball here, you'd have absolutely no clue where it was gonna oh go. Oh goodness, this is completely unpredictable. This isn't working! Things can't fall. This is horrible! Fix it! For years, not just Einstein, but many physicists tried to get gravity to work in the very small world. They needed some way to calm down that jumpiness that made it so hard to get the ball from A to B, some way to calm space down a bit. But if space were made of string, then, says Brian, We smear out those jitters in the spatial fabric just enough to calm them that the ball can, in fact, predictably move through the spatial fabric. And strings do this? Here? Yes, we believe that strings do this. Well, let's watch. Okay, so if everything is made of strings, if space itself were made of strings, strings have just enough length, just enough surface to smooth out the bumps. Now, even on the small, 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 small scale, things would be able to fall. Gravity would work everywhere. Everywhere. If strings exist, then space would be smooth enough for balls to fall with predictability. This would be good. This would be great. This would be very good. Maybe. Well, I think maybe is right on target, but if, putting the maybe aside, this actually is the theory that puts together the laws of the big and the small, oh, yeah. it would be the consistent package describing perhaps everything in the universe. So this is it. You've gotten where you wanted to go, if this is true. It could be. Just think about that, just for a second. Brian described the theory to a jam-packed crowd at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the quantum jitters of space itself become increasingly large. Using all kinds of wild graphics. Woohoo, that was fun, let's do it again. And accompanied by the Emerson String Quartet. Imagine, he said, the whole universe being danced into existence by pulsating, vibrating strings. This is, of course, still a very preliminary and very tentative theory, but if it turns out to be true, strings will account for everything. The strings and string theory, even though they're all identical, can give rise to a wealth of different features in the world around us, because a string itself can vibrate in a broad spectrum of different patterns, from the expansive gaseous rings around Saturn to the countless undiscovered faraway stars. From the lance fabled to have entered Christ's side on the first Good Friday to the ink Shakespeare used to write King Lear. From the plutonium which became a mushroom cloud over Hiroshima to the subway car that may take you home tonight to the bed you may sleep in and the electromagnetic patterns in your brain caused by the dreams you may dream there. Everything physical in this universe of ours, everything we know or are likely ever to know is part of the same cosmic symphony, is made from the same fundamental music, since everything is made from string. But I still don't understand how it works. How do little strings become rocks and water and sunshine? So I asked. When you got hair in your head, you're sitting on a chair, you're wearing pants, they're all strings. Right. The idea is that all the stuff that you just described, hair and the table top and so forth, ultimately, if you examine them on sufficiently small scales, you do find atoms. That's well, the let's, old let's, idea. Let's do a little proton plucking, shall we? Okay, absolutely. Okay, so here's an ordinary atom, electrons swinging around on the outside, protons and neutrons there in the middle, that's the nucleus. Okay, now we're gonna Stop it, stop it now, and pluck. Right, so if you pluck a proton out of a nucleus and examine it very closely, we have learned that it's made of three quarks. Those are smaller particles that make up a proton. But we believe that if you look deeply inside a quark or deeply inside an electron, or in fact, deep inside any particle, you'll find a little tiny loop of vibrating energy. That's the string. Those three little strings there on those three balls? That's right. So oh. the little one wiggling kind of slowly on the left, that's producing a particle different from that one on the right that's such a doing the frug or something. That's right. You know, an electron is a string vibrating one way, a cork is a string vibrating a different way. So the particles, in a sense, are the different musical notes that these strings can play. And then those things build up and build up, eventually become your hair, your pants, and the table. That's exactly right. So everything around us is a symphony of dancing string. It's a very nice idea, but 
There are a few little problems that Brian and I will demonstrate with a dance of our own when we return. Nightline in Primetime, Brave New World continues after this from our ABC. I saw you in the audience. I think you were up in the front row, if I'm not mistaken. Very good. Some people can't yeah. get enough string theory. Take Matthew, for example. He's 14 years old. He read Brian's book, The Elegant Universe. When I found out that he was doing a speech at the Guggenheim, I had to come. Hi, David. Thank you very much. It's odd, really, that a lecture on particle physics would attract such a various and such a glamorous New York crowd. That guy there is the movie actor, Rob Morrow. I've been told I look like you, so I'm glad that I have a friend. <laughs> and it's very flattering to me. <laughs> Who, on the spot, offers Brian a small part in his next film. It's small, though, but it's a little gem of a great little moment that just, oddly enough, would fit you kind of perfectly. That, that could be fun. Oh, I do. And, as is usual for Brian... I'd be happy to. There's a whole bunch of women in the audience, which his friend Thank George you. Stephanopoulos can't help but notice. So Brian's going to be the first... Uh, He's going to be the first physicist to have groupies. It's already happening, look. Yeah. Hello, mother. Well, that's his mother, actually. <laughs> but the point is, all kinds of people, including non-scientists, are showing up at these lectures, apparently fascinated by the idea that after an 80-year search like the egg from our creation myth, we may have found the fundamental theory that explains everything. And like the egg, the new theory is simple, and beautiful, as demonstrated here by artist Michael Motion. But I should warn you that the math that created this theory requires a host of strange new particles that have never been seen. But if string theory is true, the math says these other particles have to be there too. And that's not all, says Brian. The theory predicts that there are at least six and probably actually seven more spatial dimensions. Which, by the way, means nothing to me. I have no idea what that could mean. Well, I know about up, down, back, forth, and side to side. Just imagine more of them. Now, that's hard to do because I can't our imagine. intuition is built up in a three-dimensional universe. So wait a second. Here's a theory that's trying to make the world simpler to understand, but ends up with all these extra dimensions, which are where exactly? I mean, where do you see them? I, I find this harder and harder to get. We can get to the core idea by imagining that we lived in a lower two-dimensional universe, a flat universe. Would you like to uh, take a trip to this, this place? Sure. I mean, since you designed the landscape? <laughs> so, where is this? <laughs> this is three-dimensional space, the it's universe empty. around us. It's nice, it's simple. What do we do here? Oh, by the way, you're in green because you're Brian Green. I'm in red for no apparent reason. Well, we could... Try to do something in this space that's easy to do in three dimensions, like oh. trade places. Like what? Trading places. Oh, okay. Why do we just do that? Well, to show that it's easy to do that in three dimensions, but if the universe had fewer dimensions, like two or even one dimension, it'd be difficult and perhaps even impossible to trade places. Well, let's try that. Let's go to one dimension if we can. Do we, is there a position you get into for this? Yes, it's this position right here. Okay, ready, and go. Okay, so the audience should know that I'm the red one, you're the other color. Right. Now what do we do? Well, try to get by me in this one-dimensional world. To try the to, other side, that's right? That's right, try to slide right by right. me. <clears throat> right, well, you no. can't, right? You see, no, I'm because you know, in a one-dimensional world, there's just no <clears throat> room to get around me. If we added a dimension, could we do better? Well, yes, we can, let's try it. Okay, ready? Dimension! Two. Oh, ooh, thank well, you. now I have height. This is better than before. Yes, now try to get around me here. Around you? That's right. There's enough room. I, but I, I have no way to get around. Just slide I mean, up and around. Slide? I'll help you. I, like, a, like a frog, I That's can do. That's right. Oh, my. Oh, this is too hard. Let me, let me come down, because I'll tell you why. It might make more sense to go back to three dimensions, okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, me, I like really three a lot better than two yes, or one. a lot more room. For the obvious reason yes. that you can do this. It's very easy no for problem. us to move past one another in three dimensions. Now, what is the point of doing all this? Well, the idea is that the number of dimensions that the universe has has a big impact on our experience, the things that we're able to do. Yeah, well, you said before that there were seven, right? Seven or more. Or as many as seven more. Right. So when I was doing one and two, I had no idea that we could do this thing, that's right? right? That's so right. So if there are seven more, then there are so many other things I could do 
Except you said that the seven are here now? That's right. They're a little different than the ones that we're familiar with. You see, right now we see three dimensions. One, right. two, three. The others are around us, but they're tiny. They're not big. They're tiny and curled up. Tiny and curled up where? Everywhere around us, actually. I see nothing. I see well, nothing. let me show you. If we were, for instance, to focus in on this little region of space here and magnify it many, many more times over. So here we are within the fabric of space itself. Mm. And you see those little curly Q things? Yeah, yeah. Those are the new directions, the new curled up dimensions that the theory needs. So if we were small enough to actually live down there and bumped into one of those things, we would have experiences we've never had before. That's right. Of course, we're not that little. We are big. And so those are away somewhere. Around but us, but too small to be seen. And does your theory, or this theory, require these extra seven solar yes, dimensions? Yes, for the theory to hold together, you need these extra dimensions. Hmm. But if string theory requires extra dimensions that we have never seen, and extra particles that we've never seen, and strings that are too small to see, some would say, you know, this is no longer a simple, or elegant theory. It's now much too complicated and much too hard, frankly, to prove. That's completely wrong. <laughs> In fact, well, it's not completely wrong because you do have all these dimensions, these extra dimensions. Right. The key thing to bear in mind, though, is the mathematical structure behind this theory is incredibly tight. It's incredibly inflexible. It dictates these features of the universe, and that's why we take them to heart. The math insisted on these things. Absolutely. And you didn't have anything to do with that. It just came up. It emerged from the structure of the theory itself. GAB. So the math did it. One third G, I, J, K. You've got to follow where the math leads you, says Brian, and one day, if scientists find extra dimensions or some of those particles, well then, the theory may be proved. But until then, well, I have one last question. Maybe strings do explain everything, but can you have fun with them? I mean, what can you do with strings once you know they're there? Well, there are all kinds of things you can do, says Brian. As you'll see. When we began the show, we described a moment in the history of time, the first moment, when things were so dense that we could see the raw stuff of the universe. Is it possible today to see, or at least to go near, or to locate, raw stuff, the same kind of raw stuff. Well, the closest thing today that reproduces conditions that are similar to those of the Big Bang would be the center point of a black hole. The center point of a black hole? You mean when those black holes go down, 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 down that, at the bottom? That's right, when they collapse, the conditions there are somewhat akin to those that would have been around at the time of the Big Bang. So, if Homer Simpson, you familiar with Homer Simpson? Yes, I am, yeah. actually. If Homer were to find a black hole that he could peek into so he could see for himself what it's like down there, and maybe, now this would be something, maybe down at the wild bottom he could see an actual loop of string. Ow! Watch it, Coney! Yeah! Oops. Will Homer Simpson ever be able to tell us what is at the bottom of that black hole? Well, according to classical general relativity without quantum theory, the answer would be no. He will never, ever be able to tell us what is going on inside the black hole. Cool, man. So instead of getting to see a string, Homer. Oh my God, I'm going to be stuck into a black hole. I'm going to be stuck into a I'm going to be nothing. And what's going to be coming out on the other side? I don't know. Jump! Is about to become a string. He's the king, son. There may be, at this moment, raw loops of strings at the bottoms of black holes, but rather than suffer Homer's fate, physicists will not attempt direct observation. They will stick to their math or indirect proofs. Which brings us to our final question. If one day, somehow, strings are proven to be real, what could we do with them that would be neat? I think if you let your imagination run wild, you can, as the writers of Star Trek and Star Wars and Back to the Future have suggested, maybe there is the possibility of incredible space travel and perhaps even time travel. Where we're going, we don't need roads. 
Brian is not saying that once we prove string theory, the next day we can do something like this. But this kind of thing is only possible when you understand how space and time work. There's no way, I think, that one would be able to build the technology to manipulate the fabric of space and time in such exotic ways if you don't fundamentally know the laws at work. And that's what you're about to tell us, if you're lucky. That's right. How things work. Right. Brian is one of hundreds of theoretical physicists all over the world who think that now maybe we've found the theory that will lead us to all kinds of as yet unimaginable adventures. Because if we have at last found one explanation for everything, as Brian told the audience at the Guggenheim, just imagine. What if, in our lifetime, we were able to tell with certainty where the universe came from and how it all began? What if we were able to tell with certainty what the universe is made of and what it will become? That would be not just one of the great achievements of our time. It would be, he says, one of the great achievements of all time. The search for the deepest laws of the universe is a distinctly human drama, one that has stretched the mind and enriched the spirit, and as our generation marvels at its new way of asserting the world's coherence, of hearing the long sought for harmonies of nature, we are fulfilling our part. We are contributing our rung to the human ladder reaching for the stars. In some respects, television is still a fairly new medium. It only feels as though it's been around forever because most of us can't remember a time when it wasn't. But in many respects, we're still learning our own limits. Our colleagues on the technical side have totally outstripped us in terms of innovation. And already there are dozens of new technologies through which we can communicate with one another. Meanwhile, those of us who provide the information are running as fast as we can just to keep up. We've learned to do it almost instantaneously, even as it's happening in the remotest corners of the world. We are thoroughly experienced in being first with the obvious. And all the competition is driving us to do it even faster. There are some awfully good news programs already on commercial television, but even the best of them tend to look a lot alike. What Robert Krulwich and I have been testing these last few weeks with the help of the many people from Nightline who put this series together is the notion that as technology offers you more and more choices, we who provide the content will have to do the same. This was just a sample of where we can go, the kinds of subjects we can cover. If you liked it, we can do more. If you didn't, we can adjust. What we can't do anymore is stand still. I'll be back in a moment. That's our report for tonight. We hope you'll join us a little later on Nightline. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. <laughs> Ooh, uh, one last thing. Before we leave this subject of physics, I should mention some of the folks who helped us. And I got to admit that not everybody finds strings that attractive. <laughs> She's still not satisfied.